Hello biology students, this lesson is going to be on the phosphorus cycle. This first slide here, I'm just showing you various different chemical forms of phosphorus. The first one here is a P4, really not that active of a form in biological organisms. The one that is taken up by plants, the one that is used by plants and used by animals is this second one here. This is phosphate, the phosphate ion. PO4 3 minus. When it is taken up and it's used by biological organisms, it's used for various different things. It is used for the making of the universal energy currency ATP or adenosine triphosphate. It is used for making genetic information, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. The backbone of DNA has alternating sugars and phosphates, and that also happens to be the case with RNA ribonucleic acid. And this last one here, really just in plants, NADPH is a high energy molecule and nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide uh, phosphate. And that is one that we do find in plants as well. So this slide here is showing us at least portions of the phosphorus cycle. When we do talk about the phosphorus cycle, we can for the most part neglect the atmosphere because there is virtually no phosphorus that we do find in the atmosphere. There is one exception that I'll show you in the next slide, but for the most part, we don't need to talk about what is going on in the atmosphere with phosphorus. We do need to talk about what is going on in the lithosphere. Remember the lithosphere is the crust of the earth, the rocks. So that can be on the surface of the earth and it can also be what we do find at the bottom of the oceans as well. That in fact is the major reservoir for phosphorus in the form of phosphate salts. The lithosphere is the major reservoir. There is also a lot of phosphorus in the form of phosphates that do dissolve in the hydrosphere as well. So we'll also talk about what is going on with the hydrosphere and how that is taken up and used by biological organisms. But let's start our discussion where we do find most of the phosphorus and that again is going to be in the lithosphere and let's actually start with this one right at the lower left hand side here which is the rocks that we find at the bottom of the ocean so phosphates that are dissolved in solution in the hydrosphere in the oceans eventually they are going to precipitate out and they are going to form these solids these solid salts in the rock at the bottom of the oceans so from there it could dissolve back into the water but what we can also have in geologic time we can have geologic uplift. So if we do have uplift of those rocks that are on the bottom of the oceans, so now they are exposed to environmental conditions, things that can result in weathering. So that includes physical weathering from wind, from water. It can also include chemical weathering as well. So acids that can dissolve away the rock and release the phosphates. So those phosphates can then be released from the rock. They can end up in the soil. These phosphates do dissolve in water. So whether it is water in the soil or whether it is water that we do find in rivers, streams, ponds, lakes, and eventually in the ocean, it does dissolve in the water. And this is when it does now become available to biological organisms. In this form, it is inorganic, which means it is not attached to carbon. But once it is taken up by biological organisms, it will combine to form very various different organic compounds. And those include the ones that we mentioned, like the ATP, the DNA, the RNA, and the NADPH. So if we start with the terrestrial environment, we can have these phosphates that are taken up by plants. They are taken up by the roots. And phosphates are a limiting factor for plant growth. And what that means is if there are not enough phosphates available, then that's going to limit the ability of the plant to grow and reproduce and really to flourish. Once it is taken up by plants, this is really the only way that it can be passed on to and enter into the animal portion of the food chain. So herbivores, animals that are eating the plants can then take in that material, they can take in the phosphates and they can then use it for their own purposes, which again would be for making ATP, 
and for the RNA and for the DNA. And of course, then it would be passed up through the food chain as well. Plants and animals, well, eventually they well do die. So whether they die or whether we're talking about from animals, uh, urine, if we're talking about the feces, that can be returned to the soil or returned to the hydrosphere if we're talking about aquatic plants and animals. And then they are acted upon by decomposers. Decomposers or detritivores. And these ones here are going to break down that detritus, break it down into, again, these sort of basic building block components, which includes the phosphates, which can then once again be taken up by the plants and then just continue with the cycle again. So the other portion of this involving the hydrosphere, as mentioned, the phosphates do dissolve in water. So whether it is the lakes and streams or whether it is going directly into the ocean, we can have phosphates that do dissolve very, very well and are readily available in the oceans. And uh, the oceans, because they are so large, they will store a large amount of the phosphates. This phosphate can then be taken up by aquatic plants. We don't see it in the picture here, but taken up by aquatic plants and then just like the terrestrial environment can be passed on up through the food chain. Eventually over time, again, what is going to happen is those phosphates that do dissolve in the water, they will precipitate, they will form the solid once again, be returned to the lithosphere. And once that uh, that happens and we have completed the cycling as it takes place in the case of the phosphorus cycle. I mentioned there's one exception in terms of the atmosphere and phosphorus in the atmosphere and that kind of shows it in the picture here. So what this picture has is, well, we do have a vol volcanic eruption. Volcanic eruptions spew a whole bunch of things up into the atmosphere that you may not normally find in the atmosphere. And one of those is going to be the phosphorus in the form of an aerosol. This would very quickly settle down to the terrestrial and to the, the oceans, the hydrosphere as well. So it would not remain in the atmosphere for very long. This slide also has something that is very, very important in terms of the human impact and that is fertilizers. So again, phosphates, they are a limiting factor for plant growth. So in order to encourage and to maximize plant growth, again, whether it is for personal residential use or whether it is for agriculture for farmers, what is done is fertilizers are put on the crops and on the plants. So in these fertilizers, what you do find are things that are limiting factors for plant growth. And so if you provide them, then it will encourage the plant growth. So that includes nitrogen in the form of nitrates, NO3 minus, typically in the form of the nitrates. And it also includes exactly what we are talking about, which are the phosphate ions, PO4-3 minus. So quite often what does happen is the fertilizer is not dissolving in the soil or it's not taken up by the plants. It ends up in the surface water and then it enters into the rivers, the lakes and the streams and so on. Or if there's an excess amount of fertilizer that is used, it does still end up in the runoff. So when that does happen, what we now have is an excess amount of these fertilizers, the phosphates and the nitrates that end up in the waterways. And that's what can lead to some significant environmental impacts that we'll see shortly related to the phosphorus cycle and also to the nitrogen cycle. This one here shows a little bit more of that. So we do also see here that, yes, there are some things that are going on in the hydrosphere. It's not just the phosphates and the terrestrial plants and animals. A similar sort of cycling process is taking place in the hydrosphere as well. But this one does show, again, fertilizer runoff. So primarily from agriculture, but certainly there are some other kind of big contributors as well, like golf courses. And in addition to the fertilizer, other things like sewage. In sewage, whether it is human sewage, whether it is sewage that's coming from um, agriculture, so whether it is from cattle or whether it is from pigs, this can also end up in the waterways. And just like the fertilizer that we add to crops, the sewage contains huge amounts of the nitrogen in the form of the nitrates and the phosphorus in the form of the phosphates. And this will eventually enter into the hydrosphere and that is where it begins to create the problems, problems like what we do see here. 
So what we see growing on top of this uh, pond or lake is some algae. And these algae, they flourish. They are aquatic plants. And when we do have fertilizer that is going into the waterway, then that is going to provide more fertilizer for the growth of these algae. And that is exactly what they do. As they do grow, they flourish, and eventually they may end up blocking the sunlight from penetrating a little bit deeper down into the waterway, but they can create some other problems as well. So if we sort of follow the sequence of events here, again, it is for both nitrogen and for the phosphorus. Nitrogen in the form of the nitrates, phosphorus in the form of the phosphates. This is what is in fertilizer. So Farmers put it on their crops, golf courses put it on the lawn, residential uh, owners, uh, homeowners, they put it on their lawns as well. And eventually it does, well, make its way into the waterways. So rain causes the runoff into the streams, the rivers, the lakes. And now we have an increase in the nitrogen and phosphate levels in the waterways. So what does this actually do? Well, we just saw that picture of what is referred to as an algal bloom. So an overgrowth of the algae, algal bloom, that is the impact. So what's the big deal if we have an excess amount of algae that are growing? Well, again, they live and eventually they die. When things die, they decompose. Decomposers are bacteria. Bacteria use oxygen. So what that means is that what we're going to have in this waterway is now a decrease in the oxygen. Well, in the water, there are organisms that require oxygen, just like we require oxygen. This fish that we see here, it requires oxygen. Things that the fish eat, which might be bugs, they require oxygen. So what we have is these things that require oxygen, well, they start to die off. So the bugs that the fish eat, they're going to die off closer to the bottom of the food chain. The fish, especially active fish like trout, they require a lot of oxygen. They're not going to survive. They are going to die off. And a complete disruption of the ecosystem is going to be taking place. So now we have the different uh, aspects of the phosphorus cycle. So here we did talk about the cycling process, again, mostly through the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the biological organisms. We had the major reservoir, the lithosphere. We had the various different chemical forms that you should be aware of. We had processes that were involved, processes like decomposition and weathering. And of course, we had the human impact, the major human impact in this case, which was the algal bloom and the eventual death of things like fish.